So, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, so, Lizette Sutherland has written a handbook and runs a workshop on working together anywhere to help companies and individuals learn how to align, communicate, collaborate, and have fun online. She's given a number of presentations all over the world, and we're super lucky to have some time with Lizette this afternoon. Uh, I know I'm excited to learn more about systems and practices that can not just help us to work remotely, but to help us to do it more successfully. Uh, but Lizette, before we actually get into this afternoon, I understand you have a bit of a surprise uh, and some good news for everyone joining us today. Well, I thought uh, that people afterwards would want to have uh, some resources for successful remote working. So I have put together uh, a, a super kit, a remote working super kit that people can download. And it has icebreakers, time zone tips, meeting facilitation tips, everything you might need uh, to work remotely. And for people that download this while we're talking today, um, I'm going to give away one copy of the book, Work Together Anywhere. Um, so that is, a, but it has to be done. So while, while you're listening to us today, if you download the super kit, I'll put up the link just again so that people can see it. It's just collaborationsuperpowers.com slash super kit. I'll, I'll select one person uh, who's downloaded it to get the book. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, yes, that's going to be great for someone to receive. So this getting into things now, uh, this year, you know, people have had a number of challenges uh, and in particular HR teams. And that's obviously what we're here to talk about this afternoon. And wh what we're going to do is talk more about remote working, covering the issues and ideas that are not only going to help us now, uh, but also in the future, um, as of undoubtedly there's going to be a lot more flexibility and a lot more remote working going forward now. Back in March, uh, we all left the offices that we worked in, for those of us that did. We had no idea how long it was going to be for. Uh, and we basically moved our in-office workday to then being online. Uh, and I think we, we all experienced a number of challenges. What should we have done at the time uh, to be more effective and, and, and how can people approach their day now? Oh, well, so that's a big question. So at the time, I think we were all just surviving, right? And mm -hmm. trying to figure out like what is happening? How bad is Corona going to actually be? And it turns out it's pretty bad. It's not 1918 levels as we know, but, uh, but it's still, uh, it's still pretty bad. And so one of the things that I would say that uh, people should be focused on is really thinking about what do I need to be most productive? And so a lot of us, when we went, left the office, we started camping out at our own kitchen tables. You know, we put up a little side desk somewhere. And I would say now that we know that Corona is going to be here for the foreseeable future, we're not sure what's going to happen. I would advise people to really make yourselves comfortable. Uh, maybe that means getting a sit-stand desk or a better chair, um, a better table, maybe a headset, a, you know, a webcam. If you have the luxury of having some spare money, I would say, you know, spend it on making yourself comfortable so that you can be productive from home. Um, that would be the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have to talk about how to then align as your as a team. Uh, to do that. And one of the biggest mistakes that companies made when we went remote is that we tried to translate what we did in the office online. And some things don't translate very well. For instance, most people are talking about meeting fatigue right now, just vir Zoom fatigue. I think we've been hearing about a virtual meeting fatigue, whatever tool that we're using. Um, and that is actually a significant issue. And so there are some ways to get around virtual meeting fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go into it now if you want. Uh, please or we can please do. Okay. I, I know that's something that I, <laughs> I'm definitely facing right now. So and I'm sure I'm not alone. No, indeed. No, I think everybody's facing that right now and uh, even seasoned remote workers. Uh, so one of the things uh, that we're realizing is that, uh, you know, with meeting fatigue, uh, that we the easy place to start, I would say, is to shorten our online meetings. So if you're having a one hour meeting, shorten it to 45 or 50 minutes. You will still get the same amount done. I promise. We usually fill the time that we've scheduled for ourselves. So if you schedule 50 minutes and then we need a 10 to 15 minute break in between, that's mm -hmm. sort of the low, low hanging fruit. Now, about the break, the thing that's important about the breaks is often when we take these breaks in between meetings, we're checking our email or maybe social media. And when we get done with work from the day, uh, we are going onto Netflix or YouTube to sort of relax and watch videos. And what's happening is that we're, we're spending too much time in 2D. 
So uh-huh. just too much screen time. So I would say for those breaks, don't check email, actually get up and move around, maybe do some chores. Movement is really key mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the breaks. And if it's possible to get outside, even for just 10 minutes, standing on your balcony or in front of a window to get fresh air, that's that's even better. So I would say doing something that's movement, movement outside uh, is better than almost everything. So if you have the luxury to do that, try not to spend so much time in 2D. And I mean, one of the, as a personal anecdote, one of the things I had to do for myself was to find a new hobby that didn't inv- didn't involve screens because I was doing, you know, lots of things online and then offline also more things just as a hobby doing things online. So I've actually had to, like, I took up sewing and embroidery. I tried to find a bunch mm-hmm. of different things that were not screen related. So that's low-hanging fruit. And I would say the next level that companies need to go to is we need to then figure out, do we really need that meeting to begin with? Or can what we're doing and talking about be done asynchronously? So for example, if we're just getting together to have a status update together, we might consider sending that via text. So whatever uh, tool that you're using, it can be email or Slack or Microsoft Teams, whatever it is. So a status update, we would do that asynchronously. Um, Or another example would be uh, if we were coming to a meeting just to listen to somebody give a presentation, we might have that person record the presentation in advance, send it to everybody before the meeting starts, and then use our valuable time for discussions and decision making. So the idea is one, shorten the meeting so that we get breaks in between, and then evaluate whether or not we need that meeting to begin with, and really think about how we can become more asynchronous. That's the key, because when we go asynchronous, we get more time for ourselves for deep work, so we get more control over our day. Um, And it also has the effect where if we're sending out presentations in advance or we're brainstorming in advance, that people actually get more time to think Mm -hmm. and to you know, sort of have the ideas seep in and then we come to better decisions afterwards. Because sometimes we're in a meeting, we're time boxed, the decision that we make in this time is the decision that we make. And when we go online, we really need to just be more conscientious about that. So that's really the key. And just to note, there are companies out there that are 100% asynchronous and that they never speak They never meet. They never see each other. They do everything through chat and ticketing systems. So it exists on a scale. And I think that every company is going to need to find their yin yang between Mm -hmm. asynchronous and synchronous work. But just so that people know, there is a huge scale out there that's actually quite important. That there's some fantastic tips there, and 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 thank you uh, for uh, for giving us a little bit of a list of, of some of the things that we need to actually do. Um, I mean, thinking time you mentioned, and, I, and that's something that has uh, come up. Uh, I know I work in an organisation and where a lot of people love their whiteboard, their creativity, uh, and that's something that people have been struggling uh, with trying to replicate online. Is there anything that any tools or any tips that you can give us for how people can try and do that? Oh, absolutely. So one of the things, when we go online, one of the key skills that we need to get good at is virtual whiteboarding. Mm -hmm. So we have whiteboards in the office where we can ideate, write things down, really show somebody like, hey, this is the process that I'm thinking, or this is what, you know, this is what the organization looks like to me, the structure looks like to me. And when we go online, we tend to not do that. There are wonderful virtual whiteboards out there and hundreds of them. The Mm -hmm. most popular kids on the block that everybody's using these days is Google Jamboards, a very simple one that's for free. There's Miro and there's Mural. Those are sort of the three most popular. But just to note that there are now whiteboards that you can project onto your walls and then actually put sticky notes, add pictures, write things on the virtual whiteboard and people from any device can access those. So you can go from very like a simple whiteboard Mm -hmm. in a browser to a whiteboard that's actually projected on a wall somewhere um, where hybrid teams can ideate. So I would say that is whiteboarding is one of the key skills in the virtual workforce because if we just communicate via text, a lot gets lost. We really do need to draw, Mm -hmm. picture, visualize for each other. Exactly. Yeah, we, as I said, that's definitely what we've been finding. And, and I know that uh, I've had meetings with people that have started using windows in their houses to, to try and replicate that. But, but again, that, it, that doesn't work. It's just that's just them on their own. Um, so fantastic. That's some great tools to, uh, to check out there. Thank you. 
Um, one of the other things that I know, speaking to uh, either some of my colleagues or some of my counterparts, is uh, this this feeling of death by presentation. So in the office, uh, obviously things are more visible. People can actually see, managers can see what people are doing uh, and, and, and there's more an understanding of what people are working on. Whereas now that that's, you know, we are remote, I think some of that has disappeared. And again, it comes back to, I think, some of the, some of the managers themselves, but give, send me a presentation on that, send me a presentation on this, send me another presentation on that. How how can we try and get around some of that, uh, you know, kind of actual physical need for people to understand w what people are working on? So there's a there's a number of different ways to do that. So, but in terms of presenting, I would say that there are some tips for presenting online, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure if that's what you mean, or if you mean to like send me a PowerPoint on what you're going to talk about. Is that what you're talking? So Is more more mean? just more just the updates. So the lack of visibility of what people are actually doing on a day to day basis. So a little a little bit more that that sense. The work, work I think you know kind of the work out loud uh, type of type of thing. Okay, so indeed, so I was gonna I was gonna give my online presentation tips, but this well, let's is come, let's come different. to that one next. <laughs> we'll go that we'll go there yeah. next, yeah, because that's that's always good. But indeed, one of the main questions that people have when we go remote is how do we know what other people are doing? Mm -hmm. And there is the concept you just mentioned, which is called working out loud. And the idea behind that is we're just making our work observable to others. So it could be that working out loud means that you're having a daily stand up meeting, and you know that's a synchronous time and mm -hmm. software teams do this all the time. They sync up for 10 minutes every day and they just talk about what did I do yesterday? What am I planning on doing today? And are there any roadblocks in my way? So there's, you know, there's simple that. There's other people that use group chat systems to work out loud. They just are continuously in conversation throughout mm -hmm. the day. Um, that's another way to do that. And there are more sophisticated tools out there actually, such as virtual offices. And these are exactly what it sounds like. It's an office that you go to online. Um, um, and you can see where your colleagues are. There's, it's sort of split into different squares, like every office is its own square, and then there's a little icon for the colleague. But you can see where everybody is on the floor plan. So that also takes us out of having to call somebody and saying, hey, do you have time next Wednesday at 2 o'clock for this meeting? You could actually now go knock on somebody's virtual door, just ask your question, and then go back to your own office. Mm -hmm. So it sounds really strange until you start to use it, but I think a lot of us right now are really suffering from loneliness and isolation. Yes. You know, we can't be with other people. Uh, we can't be with our colleagues physically. And so there are alternatives to doing it virtually. You know, it's not as great as being in person. I think nothing nothing will be, but it's a, it's a very good second alternative. So I do encourage people to experiment with virtual offices. I've got a huge list of tools on my website. It's easy to find. Um, and there are about 20 different virtual offices on the market right now that people mm -hmm. can experiment with. And then the other ways, you know, if I go a little bit far out, I just want to let people know where the market is headed, but there are telepresence robots where you beam in just like on Zoom or Skype or any other tool that you would use, mm -hmm. except for that you can move yourself. You're actually beaming into a life-size robot that rolls around and you can drive wow. it using the arrow keys on your keyboard. So there are offices that work 50-50. So 50% 50 of the people come in in the flesh and 50% mm -hmm. are there via robot. Yep. Um, and it's just a matter of getting used to it. It's weird until you try it. Just like, you know, just like the first iPod was weird until we got <laughs> used to the whole, the circle thing. And then, and then it was okay again. So all of these technologies are going to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And then one of the last ones that I'll mention is virtual reality. It sounds very far out, but but a lot of teams are starting to experiment with virtual reality. So you'd put on your goggles, you'd step into your virtual conference room, sit around a table with your virtual colleagues. You can bring up YouTube videos and, you know, you can write things and pass that writing on to the next person. So, uh, you know, a lot of us are still struggling with sort of basic communication tools and spider phones and conference room phones and things like that. So virtual reality seems really far out, but I really believe that the teams that can master being in some sort of a virtual office or virtual reality and some of these more sophisticated tools, they will truly have superpowers in the future because the type of collaboration that you can do is so powerful. So and in terms of, you know, in terms of working out loud, mm -hmm. that's that's sort of where where things are going. But, you know, the idea of just having a daily stand up or just mm -hmm. letting people know what you're working on. Some people use their status updates in Slack or Skype. You know, there's a little place where you can put a little status. You could also write what you're working on 
And there's tools okay. where you can write down what you've done that day and it sends it out. So there's lots of ways, but I think we just need to be a little bit more conscious and learn what the new tools are that can accommodate that. Definitely. Uh, I didn't realize there were so many, so many virtual tools and virtual offices that are uh, actually out there. So I know I'm going to start, start looking into We've come a long way in the last those. few years. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I'm going to come back to the presentations one. But before we do, uh, you mentioned obviously about the social element. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, that is something that we are hearing uh, a lot at the moment. People feeling lonely, as you said, isolated, really missing the social connection in the office. Uh, and I think team building uh, is, is one of those things as well. A number of companies, especially within iGaming, would have had a number of different team building events and things that are now not happening. <clears throat> um, what, what, can you, what can you tell us about how to try and do some team building online? So there are hundreds of ways of doing team building online. However, when the I would say the main thing about remote team building is that we need to be deliberate about it. Because if you leave team building to chance, chances are it's going to get left behind. So the most important thing is whatever you try, whether it's virtual coffees or quiz nights or just virtual lunches <laughs> together, just make sure that it's not left to chance. So one of the new roles that I see emerging in offices these days is the role of a virtual office manager. So we have this, you know, in the office, there's an office manager. They make sure that the coffee's always there, that the birthdays are remembered, the files are organized, and a virtual office manager can have some of the same functions. So they can make sure that the virtual lunches are happening, um, that uh, people are getting together, that files are organized the same role. So there is actually a role for sort of a logistics person um, to sit on top. And it doesn't have to be a new person on the team. It can be somebody on the team that might enjoy uh, this role. Role. There's usually always somebody who would love sort of doing this kind of thing. So one, being deliberate. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked for a team that used to have virtual coffee every Wednesday. So mm -hmm. it would just be every Wednesday at noon, we'd get together, whoever was around and wanted to, we would just come online for 30 minutes, have a cup of coffee together, and then move on with our day. So it wasn't obligatory, uh, but it was just an opportunity for all of us to get together. Otherwise, we would just be busy with our own work. So yes. another option in terms of loneliness and sort of isolation that we're really experiencing right now is uh, trying virtual co-working together. So it could just be like Fiona, you and I would get together and we would work on our own things, but we would have a Zoom link open with the vid maybe the video on and the sound on so we could see each other and it would sort of simulate what it's like to work side by side together. Okay. Um, so uh, there's options like that. There's actually apps for this that are out there. Mm -hmm. for everything I mentioned, there's an app for, there's an app for everything these days. <laughs> so but there's one in particular called Focus Mate, where mm -hmm. you log in, you get paired up with a random person in the world. Okay. You get together, you tell each other what you're going to work on. And then an hour later, you ask each other, did you finish what you were working on? So it's like an accountability partner. You know, if you're having a mm -hmm. hard time getting motivated, you could just check in with your Focus Mate. And I would say, you don't need to be paired randomly with somebody in the world, pair yourself or, you know, get a group together within your own company. Mm -hmm. to work together virtually. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a meeting. It just is a session together. So, and then there are tons of games. I've got an ultimate list of team building activities available on the website. So if you're looking for really good games to play together, um, then, you know, there's a whole, there's puzzles and uh, speed typing contests and, you know, watching movies together. There's all kinds of things. And especially since COVID hit, we've all gotten very creative about how we're connecting with each other online. One thing I would be careful of uh, as HR is, you know, getting too much 2D time. A lot of times yes. people are burnt out at the end of the day. And the last thing they want to do is go to a virtual quiz night. You know, they, it's like they'd rather just be with their family. And so I would say with all of these team building things, make them optional. Mm -hmm. People that want to come, that have the bandwidth to be there. There's always going to be a group. Um, so that, that would be important. But in terms of in, in team building, the key is to be deliberate, to not let it, not leave it to chance. Okay, thank you, and uh, and you and you're so right about the about the coffee uh, meetups and things as well. We actually had our first one uh, at Katena this morning. Uh, we had the barista who uh, our normal on-site barista in the Malta office, and we asked him to host it. And he was sharing some secrets and tips on coffee making, and and we used Zoom and had different breakout groups, and uh, we we received some fantastic feedback from doing that just for half an hour, and and it gave people an opportunity to actually see people 
and just have a chat uh, with people that they're not working with on a on a day to day basis that you would probably run into, you know, walking up to our level six where the where the barista is located to get your coffee. So yeah, yeah, de definitely some some really simple things, uh, but you know, kind of they take a little bit to set up. So it's good to share that around, not just from the HR team, but even across the company, as you mentioned as well. People that uh, you know, kind of are, are keen to help with doing those types of things. Yeah, and the, yeah, they could be really fun. And what I would say is start with an icebreaker question. If you don't know mm -hmm. what to talk about in the first one, just set up an icebreaker question. I've got hundreds of those on my website as well, so feel free to go there. But you know, something as fun as like take a picture of what's on your feet right now and show us what you're wearing. You know, people hold up their phones to the screen, or mm -hmm. you know, give some put show us something that's on your desk that you really like. You know, th those are all really fun ways to just start a conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we did, uh, so when you were talking about presentations, uh, you know, we mentioned obviously PowerPoint death by pre presentation, but you, uh, you alluded to having some tips on how people can actually uh, do some better presentations. So please, please share what, uh, what tips you have for us. So it's not, there's not a lot of tips I would say in there, but mm -hmm. a couple of things that I've noticed is one, when we're giving presentations, people tend to have their video off. We're so used to the old fashioned webinar with voice and slides. Mm -hmm. And there are now, and I would say, you know, there is no one that I know has sat through a webinar without multitasking. And that's not really the point of mm -hmm. showing, you know, we're hoping that we're giving valuable information. And I think one of the keys of why it's so, so much less engaging is because we can't see the person that's speaking. Yes. It's uh, seeing the person is so engaging. So before when I was showing uh, that I had you know, that I had my book available. Mm -hmm. So this is one way that I can just, you know, I could just show slides while I'm talking. And it's so much more engaging than if I were to just, you know, disappear. Like, uh, so all of a sudden now you're just hearing a voice and slides and you could probably already feel a drop in engagement rather yeah. than if you could see me on top of the slide. So I would say, make sure this is a tool called, mm -hmm, which is a terrible name, I think, but, uh, but it's a really <laughs> fantastic tool. It's one of my favorites. But it's called mm -hmm, M M H M M. And it allows me to just show things in my background. I can show videos. I can show whatever it is that I want. So I've got, uh, I've got a bunch of these things set up. So I would say that that is you know, one of the keys to making presentations engaging is to show people who's speaking. Mm -hmm. And I know we all like to hide behind our cameras, but I, when we're going online, especially if you want to take away that sense of isolation and loneliness, being able to see each other is one of the easiest things that we can do to build trust and camaraderie um, and to make presentations far more interesting. So I would say, if you're giving a presentation online, keep it to seven minutes, 10 minutes okay. before you stop and ask for feedback. And if it's longer than that, consider just sending it to people before. There's no use for all of us to get together live and then have me just give a presentation that I could have recorded. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's not the best use of people's time anymore. So yeah, turn the cameras on. I would say that's my biggest tips for, for solving death by PowerPoint is let us see behind the person behind the voice. Fantastic. I loved how you actually faded in and out then when you did that as well. That was pretty cool. It's <laughs> a, a great tool. <laughs> it is. Um, so one of the things that uh, that has become critical throughout this period, and I mean, it's all it's it's always highly important, is 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 around leadership and and certainly managing um, individuals through through uh, you know kind of this this pandemic and and working remotely in a new situation. Uh, so. What, uh, you know, kind of, again, what, what can you share with us that you've learned along the way of how leaders can actually better lead and manage their teams um, and maybe even getting into the element of trust because that seems to be, a, you know, a, a more and more hot topic on a day-by-day -day basis now uh, because it's so critical with, with understanding what people are doing and what they're delivering. Indeed. Yeah. Trust is the glue that will bind mm -hmm. your team together and you can work without trust, but it's a less fun work environment. So it is possible. But so trust, I, I always say the building blocks of trust on a remote team are uh, reliability. So mm -hmm. are you going to do what you say you're going to do? Consistency. So the quality of your work is consistently good. And then uh, responsiveness. 
Can I find you if I need to? Because we're so out of sight, we're where we can be out of mind and we tend to make assumptions just as humans. That's just a human thing. So if somebody's not responding, uh, we tend to make a negative assumption about why. Mm -hmm. So on a remote team, those things, if we can really uh, be reliable, consistent and responsive, that goes a long way to building trust. Now, the fourth ingredient that I would add to that is likability. Do I feel like my team has my back? Like if I make a mistake, will I be blamed or will my team help correct me and help me move forward? That is a huge factor in terms of building trust. So I would say for leaders out that are out there, uh, especially in COVID times, one of the things that I recommend is just reaching out one-on-one -on -one regularly to the people on your team. And it doesn't have to have an agenda, but it's just a check-in. And I got this tip because 10 years ago, I worked with a company in California. I'm in the Netherlands. And about two, three days a week, my boss used to call me on, on his way to work. And at the, the beginning, I was like, what do you need, boss? What's going on? And he would just say, I'm just calling to say hi and just to see if you needed anything. You know, and sometimes it would evolve into a, some, a conversation where we'd actually talk about stuff. And other times I'd say, no, no, I'm busy. Everything's good right now. I'm just moving on. Mm -hmm. And then it would be like a two minute conversation. But over time, a friendship developed and a real, a trust developed between us two because he was just checking in for the sake of being human, not for any agenda. And 10 years later, I just went back to San Francisco to visit family. And he was one of the people that I visited because we're still friends to this day because of those conversations. So one of my favorite quotes from the interviews that I've, that I've done is connection happens when we pay attention to each other. So as a leader, I would say it's really important just check in with your team, especially during COVID times. We are all experiencing unprecedented levels of stress and uncertainty. And so as a team, if we can care for each other, that's going to go a long way. Beyond that, I would say one of the things that I, that I encourage leaders to do is get in the mud with your team and really understand what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So that you're, it's not hearsay. Join the meeting. See where the problems are. Maybe somebody has a really bad internet connection. And as a leader, you can take those roadblocks out of the way. You know, you'd help them get a better internet connection, or maybe they need a webcam, or maybe they need to learn how to facilitate online meetings. That's also a new skill that, you know, people are, are, are starting to learn. So as a leader, really get in the mud with your team, understand the roadblocks that they're experiencing. And I think that it's, it's the leader's job to set the path and to, to say, this is, this is where we're going to, and then to help take any roadblock out of the way so that our teams can take us there. So that's sort of my personal philosophy okay. on leadership is I really feel like leaders set the goalpost and then the yes. professionals take us there and leaders are there to take, you know, they're not there to micromanage, they're there to take away the impediments. Ab so, absolutely. Uh, and that, and that, that is super critical, uh, as you said, especially in, in, especially in these times now as well. Thank you. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about uh, the the robot, um, about the 50-50, you know, set up between office and, and, and people at home. Uh, and I think that's something that we've seen for a little time, maybe not so much on the 50-50 basis. There's been, a, there's been a few people that have worked remotely for one reason or another, but I think that's something that we're going to see a lot more of as we go forward, uh, that, that hybrid model. What... Uh, what can you share on, on how we can best manage that? I mean, it's one of the most complex structures that we can have where we have people in different scenarios. And I think that, you know, we've, we've been lucky to some extent now with everyone, you know, being more remote because it, it, it does make things easier. But now having that split, how do, how do we approach it? Yeah, the hybrid model of working where some people are at the office and some people are elsewhere is mm -hmm. the most difficult style. And it does, by all statistics and polls and everything that's been done out there, that's the model that we're headed towards yes. is people want choice. We want the choice to work when and where we're most productive. And so even when lockdowns end and it's safe to go back to the office, there's a large percent of it the percentage of us that would like to have the freedom of whether to come into the office or not, or just to work where we want to work. Mm -hmm. And so I would say for hybrid working, there's a couple of key things. One is create a team agreement together. And I would say every team needs this, but if you're working hybrid, you, it's critical. It's critical that you need this. So a team agreement just outlines what is our normal way of working? What is the normal behavior that we're expecting? You know, are there core hours that everybody's expected to be online or can it run the gamut? Can you just work, you know, if somebody wants to work at midnight, does it matter? But, you know, do you need to overlap time? Uh, what are the tools that you're going to use? 
Some people are phone people, others are WhatsApp people, others are email people. You need to align on which, how are you going to communicate with each other? And then of course, how do you know what each other are doing? So really figure out, uh, you know, what, what kind of things do you have in place to be able to have visibility into what other people are doing? And those team agreements, it sounds really simple, but almost nobody has one out there. I'd say 80% of companies that I've worked with don't have a team agreement at all. And it's kind of crazy because you would never get an orchestra together and say like, all right, just go play or a sports team, right? You would tune and practice. And with our teams, we also need to do that. And with hybrid working, that it's especially important to align on terms of how we're going to work together. Mm -hmm. Now, the second aspect to that is infrastructure. We need to set up our offices so that it is easy for remote people to call in for meetings and so that they are present in meetings. So that old spider phone that we used to have in the middle of the conference room tables, you know, where you have to like lean in like, hey, Bob, it's Lisette. <laughs> those are should be a thing of the past, right? Like those, that's not what we want. When we in our hybrid meetings, we want remote participants to be present and visible in the room and as life-size as possible so that they're not teeny tiny boxes across a screen somewhere, mm -hmm. that they're actually physically present and that you feel their presence in the room. So there's a lot of offices that are going to have to go through some sort of infrastructure revamp in order to accommodate this hybrid style of working. But luckily it's not difficult and the tools are no longer expensive. We don't have to have, you know, we don't have to redo everything. You can just get some simple uh, conference room equipment. You know, we just need to be able to see each other, share screens and hear each other. And after that, you know, we just have to be able to run good meetings. Mm -hmm. But so for hybrid, I mean, there's a whole, I have a million tips, of course, but, uh, but I would say for hybrid uh, working, really create a team agreement and then make sure that you have good infrastructure in place and not just for the office, but for the individual worker themselves. So for instance, um, uh, there, there's a company that I interviewed in Australia and they were founded by digital nomads. So that means that they were traveling and working at the same time. That's what their lifestyle was to travel while working. Mm -hmm. And that's a new, that was a new thing coming well before COVID hit. Now, one of the things that they offer their employees is the same privilege. They say, you've got three months for three months out of the year, we would like you to travel. You're allowed to go anywhere you want. However, you have to have an internet connection of 20 megabits per second or faster. Otherwise you're considered on vacation. So if people are going to work in other locations, there need to be some criteria about what makes it okay. So if they're working in another location and they're completely out of touch, that's not okay because mm -hmm. that's not how we simulate the office online. So definitely just getting into that and making it a little bit more clear what's expected of people and that they have the proper office at home and at work in order to be able to connect with each other. Fantastic. Um, just on the back of that, talking about the office at home, uh, I know at the moment HR teams are getting a lot more questions uh, from individuals who, who normally work in an office and, and have now been working remotely, uh, just asking around, um, you know, kind of allowances for equipment and, uh, you know, those types of things. What, what, I mean, what do you consider to be the kind of like the core basics uh, and, and what should a company provide versus maybe the individual themselves? Yeah, it's a, a, that's a tough question in terms of who provides what, because it's so mm. different everywhere you go. And like, if you're a freelancer, you're responsible for yourself. And if you're a company, but I would say if you're a company and you have the resources, it is in your best interest to make sure that your employees have the equipment that mm. they need. And I would say at a minimum, a, night, a good headset. You don't need to have my the super fancy Bose QC35. That's what I have. But you know, this is this is what I do for a living. So it's worth. Mm -hmm. It's in my best interest to to have the best stuff. But I would say a headset a webcam and a good chair will go a long way. And then on top of that, if you have the luxury, I would get a sit stand desk. Mm -hmm. I have one of these Ikea desks where you just put a button and it, and it lifts, but I, because as knowledge workers, we sit a lot and even just the, the movement is really important. And then the other thing I would say, another luxury item would be an external monitor because we need more real estate. Now that we're doing video meetings, if you really want to collaborate with people, you're going to want to have your virtual whiteboard on one screen and your colleagues on another so that you can see everything at once. So we're starting to get a bit sophisticated with equipment in this, in this way. However, the prices have come way down. And I really do think as HR professionals, it's in our best interest to make sure that our workers can be productive at home because if we don't have the proper equipment, if like if people are sitting at really bad desks or with, you know, with bad ergonomics, we're going to get it. The cost will come back in health yes. of our employees. So, 
Yeah, you know, in all these meetings where people show up and we spend the first 10, 15 minutes of the meeting dealing with technical <laughs> issues, we've got to get more. That's a lot of money. As an owner of a company, I would be very, very concerned if that was happening. And, you know, that is a lot of money depending on who's in that meeting. And so what we're trying to do is get more like Star Trek, where you can push a button, connect, mm -hmm. and then move on again. So that's Excellent. where I would say, I don't know whose responsibility it no, is. That's a really I think that's, gray area. It's a, but... That's going to be a tough one, that one, I'm sure. Um, so we're in the yeah. last we're in the last couple of minutes, unfortunately, uh, Lisette. So, and and I have, I have so many more questions. Um, but kind of the one that I do want to put to you at the moment is is something that, uh, again, I, you know, I know that I'm hearing a lot from a lot of my colleagues and, and it's important for us as a company as well, is around culture. And I think off the back of what we were talking about in terms of the hybrid structure, where culture of a company is really important and really valuable, how do we try and maintain that culture or, you know, kind of or, or continue to grow that culture with having a lot more of the workforce remote? Any tips? So, uh, yeah, I can, I have, yeah, I've always, I've always got it. Um, so one of the things is regular feedback loops for the team. Mm -hmm. So software teams have really good system. Most software teams uh, work in sort of an agile way and they've got their agile system set up, which means that they start the week with a planning meeting. They end the week with uh, showing what they've done. So, you know, every week has a sprint and every sprint has sort of a plan. So you've, you've, you show up what you're done. And then the other key thing that they do is they have regular retrospectives where they don't talk about how did the project go. They talk about how are we doing as a team? You know, what's going well? What do we still need to learn? What are some of the roadblocks? And so getting together regularly and putting those loops in place will help maintain the culture of an organization. So whether it's retrospectives or um, other feedback loops are, you know, checking in one-on-one, -on -one, the daily stand-ups, just some sort of loop that you're just not going, you know, the annual performance review is not going to cut it online. We need to be doing sort of monthly feedback, how is the team doing on a regular basis? So that's one. And then another idea that I, that I got from a company that I was consulting with is they had a specific channel in their Slack group. You could replicate that in whatever group chat system that you have, mm -hmm. but they had a specific channel around values. And so if somebody had a decision to make, and they chose, they made that decision based on one of the company values, like the, maybe the value is transparency. And so they would put in the Slack channel, I made this decision and I did it this way because I know that we value transparency. And so I, I made this decision with that value in mind. And they just had a channel where they would just list out in these things where they had a difficult yeah. decision to make mm -hmm. and then why they made that decision. And that also reinforces the values that the company is striving for. You know, we can't be 100% transparent maybe, but we can strive for that transparency. And so when leaders and colleagues are showing that they're making decisions based on the values that the team has agreed upon, mm -hmm. it actually went a long way to show the types of behaviors that we want to model for each other. So regular okay. feedback loops and finding ways to highlight our values and, uh, and I would say celebrate them. Yes, yes, exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's easy in these times when things are so busy to just keep focusing on the next project, next project, but we do need to take that time to stop and, and recognise as well. So and celebrate and appreciate yeah. each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, unfortunately, our time uh, is, is coming to an end. Uh, so I am so grateful for your time this afternoon. I, I know I've enjoyed talking to you and have been taking lots and lots of notes. And I know that uh, I'm going to be looking up a number of different initiatives and, and tools. Uh, oh, and we have a special cat guest. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Oh, that is expected. That's it's my one, neighbor's cat, actually. <laughs> that's one of the best things actually about Zoom <laughs> meetings is seeing everyone's Good. pets. Uh, but thank you to everyone who has joined us and thank you so much, Lisette, for your time this afternoon and for sharing so much valuable information with us. My and pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.